Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Blanco? Here. Commissioner Lopez? Here. Commissioner Dickerson? Here. Commissioner Mohajer? Chair Seifert? Here. And uh, do we have a motion f to approve the minutes of the last meeting? I'll, I'll go ahead and approve the minutes, or the um, I'll put a motion out there for approval of the minutes of the last meeting. Thank you, Commissioner. Do we have a uh, second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Minutes. I'll recuse myself. I was absent. Thank you, Commissioner. At this time, we're going to go into the uh, public comment period, and each member of the audience may address the commission on any subject within the commission's business. Each member of the audience and each subject is limited to the discussion of three minutes or is otherwise directed by the chair. And Catherine, do you have something to add to this? Yes. If you are participating via Zoom and wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand button in the Zoom meeting portal. If you are using a phone, press star nine on your telephone keypad, then press star six to unmute your phone. <laughs> when it is your time to speak, you will be requested to unmute your microphone and speak for the time allotted by the chair. Your microphone will be muted upon completion of your comments. Unless otherwise directed by the chair, speakers will have three minutes to comment. Do we have anyone on Zoom? We do not. I don't have any slips in, uh, for the uh, public comment. Seeing no one, we'll move up. This time we're gonna go into the public hearings. Uh, number 5A, zoning text amendments for accessory dwelling units, time extensions and permit revocations. Title 12 of the City of Santa Maria Municipal Code. Can we have a presentation, please? Yes, thank you, Chair Seaford and Commissioners. My name is Dana Eady and I'm the Planning Division Manager. And I'm going to be giving you the presentation this evening regarding so, a few zoning text amendments that uh, we have to a couple of different sections of the of Title 12 of the code. Excuse me, Dana. Um, we, our screens aren't working up here. Are they supposed to be on? Uh, let's take a moment and we'll check that for you. Thank you. They should be. Looks like that, that screen's out too. What's going on? No, I keep going. We're fine. Uh -oh. It's supposed to be right in there. That's frustrating. Are they maybe we're not turned on? Could that is it that easy? No. If we could start over, thank you. Dana? Thank you. We still have one screen out, but I think we'll get that going, so. Um, okay, so back to the Title 12 zoning text amendments. So the amendments that I'm gonna be presenting to you tonight include revisions uh, to two chapters of the city's zoning ordinance. Um, that's to chapter 12-56, which is for accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units. 
and then also to chapter 12-35 uh, regarding time extensions and then a new section that we have added called uh, permit revocations. And um, as these are zoning text amendments, the Planning Commission, uh, your, your commission is going to be making a recommendation on these to the City Council. Uh, so there were two uh, state laws regarding ADUs and, and JADUs, or the junior ADUs, that were um, signed into law in January of this year. And uh, so SB 897 um, addresses the uh, maximum height limits for ADUs, for detached and attached ADUs. Uh, currently, for um, detached ADUs, the height is, is actually the um, maximum height of the underlying zone district. So, for example, in the R1 zone, the maximum height is 30 feet for a home. And so currently, our code allows you to build a detached ADU up to that height. Um, however, under the new state law, jurisdictions have the uh, flexibility to establish a maximum height limit. And so the updated ordinance that we have would uh, establish a maximum of 16 feet in height for detached ADUs. Now they can, according to the state law, go up to 18 feet in height, um, but that's if you're within a half mile of a major transit stop. And currently Santa Maria does not um, meet the definition of a major transit stop. Um, that's a, that's a uh, transit system that has stops every 15 minutes and um, is more common in larger cities. And at this po point, Santa Maria does not meet that definition. So for a detached ADU, uh, the height would be 16 feet in the single family uh, zone or with a single family dwelling and 18 feet on a lot within, with an existing or proposed multifamily structure that has more than one story. Now for attached ADUs, um, it's very similar to what we currently have. Um, it's a 25 foot maximum height or the height of the primary dwelling um, that's allowed under the zone district. So, uh, and it's whichever is lower. So what you would see for attached ADUs is a maximum height of 25 feet typically. And, um, According to the new ordinance, ADUs would not be allowed to exceed uh, two stories in height. So that's the SB 897 um, changes. Now, AB 2221 was another law that went into effect earlier this year, and that addresses the time limits um, that the city has to comply with to permit an ADU. Um, and so under this law, within 60 days of the date that the city receives a completed application for an ADU um, on a lot with an existing single family dwelling, the permit has to be approved, or if it's not approved, the city has to provide the applicant with a list in writing of all the items that are deficient and then a description of how to address those issues. And the 60 day time limit does not apply when you're building uh, like a, a new single family dwelling with an ADU. Um, the ADU would, would not be permitted until the main residence was, was constructed. So that 60 days would be, could be deferred. Uh, the other item that this law um, addressed was regarding the front yard setbacks. And um, according to this law, ADUs can encroach into the front yard setbacks if the setback itself prevents the construction of an ADU of, on that lot that's at least 800 square feet in size. Um, so that it's not intended to um, allow you to just build an entire ADU in that front yard. It's, it's really intended to, if you have a larger lot where you can maybe build part of the ADU in the front, within the front yard setback that you can encroach into the setback um, if it helps you to reach an ADU that's 800 square feet in size. Um, and also ADUs can now be attached to a detached garage. That was uh, not as clear in the, in the previous law, so that was something that was specified. 
So there's another um, section of the government code that I wanted to just bring up because it, it affects the number of ADUs that can be permitted on a lot in a single family zone um, or on a lot with a single family dwelling. And so our current ordinance allows one attached or one detached ADU per lot. And you can combine that with a junior ADU in a single family zone. So the government code has this particular section that they refer to as subdivision E. Um, it's the 65852.2E1, but they call it subdivision E um, through in the, in the state law. And um, ADUs that can be permitted under subdivision E are the types of ADUs that the city has to approve ministerially. And that means it's not subject to other areas of the state ADU law. So for example, if there's design standards, things like that, those don't get applied to these types of ADUs. Um, the building code and health and safety requirements still apply. And so this section of the state law requires the city to permit uh, the following combinations of ADUs and JADUs. So if you have a lot with a single family dwelling, you can build one ADU and one junior ADU within the existing space of a single family dwelling or an accessory structure, um, like a garage. And then you can also build a new construction detached ADU as well. Um, but there's an 800 square foot maximum size requirement for that and you have to meet the four foot rear and side yard setbacks. So you could end up with three ADUs on a single family lot um, if, you, if the applicant met the requirements to do so. Um, for junior ADUs, there is still the owner occupancy requirement in that the owner of the property has to either reside in the junior ADU or in the primary residence um, on the lot. So that's still a requirement. We have a covenant agreement or a conveyance res restriction that every applicant has to sign and have notarized and recorded uh, if they're going to do a junior ADU. Um, on lots with a multifamily dwelling, um, that is the there's no real change to our ordinance from what we've had before, but I just wanted to include it because it does fall under this subdivision E section. So if you have a lot with a multifamily dwelling, like apartments, for example, um, you can build ADUs within portions of the building that are not used as livable space. So they cite attics and I think they mentioned boiler rooms, like there's these different areas within these structures that the state cites where you can convert those areas into livable space. Um, and at least one ADU is required to be allowed. And then the other ADUs have to, co they correspond to 25% of the existing units on the site. And then you can also, and you can also build up to two detached uh, ADUs as well on lots with multifamily dwellings. And that's um, currently what we've been allowing, but again, it, it's a combination of ADUs that falls under this special subdivision E uh, section of the law. So we've added uh, some additional design standards for ADUs with the new, um, this updated ordinance. Um, it applies to new construction ADUs. It, does, it cannot apply to those ADUs that I was just mentioning that fall under subdivision E. These uh, design standards would apply to, um, let's say if someone just wants to come in and build like a 900 square foot new detached ADU on their property, then all of these design standards would apply. And so we've included uh, requirements that the materials, the color, and the roof pitch match the appearance of the primary dwelling. Um, there's some new landscaping requirements to um, put in some plants uh, along, the, along the exterior wall of the ADU or around the ADU. Um, windows and doors may not have direct line of sight to an adjoining property. 
um, there's requirements to make sure that any exterior lighting is fully shielded, directed downward, um, so dark sky compliant. And um, there's open space requirements. And that, that's still in our existing ordinance as well. It's about 300 square feet for, for the ADU and for additional 300 square feet for the home. And then also that any two-story ADUs limit the major access to stairs, decks, entry doors, and windows uh, to the interior of the lot or an alley. And then a new requirement as well that we've added is to have applicants provide the city with an estimate of the monthly rent that they will be um, charging for the ADU and then to report that annually to the city. And the reason for that is that the data that we uh, can get from that is it's really important because it, it helps the city to assess the affordability of these ADUs to determine whether they fall under the, like a low or very low type of income category. And then we can include this information in our general plan annual report as well. Um, so that concluded the, the changes to the ADU section of the code. So I'm gonna move into to this other section. It's chapter 12-35. Um, and so we are uh, proposing to um, include some additional information to clarify uh, when permits are deemed established and also the process to file a time extension. So currently, um, plan development permits and conditional use permits are valid for a period of three years, and that is not proposed to change. So it would still be three years. Um, however, we are including that the original decision maker on the project can grant a time extension of up to two years and there's some findings that have to be made uh, for that to occur. And they're similar to what we have now. It's that adequate due diligence to implement or complete the permit has been made, or that there are significant economic factors that justify additional time on the permit. Um, so if, if your commission or if it went to the city council were able to make those findings, then the extension could be granted. One change that we are um, proposing to make is Currently, there is a seven-year maximum on permits, um, and if, if they go beyond seven years, then they are uh, formally expired at that time. We're proposing to remove that time limit, and we're not going to have a limit on the number of extensions that can be approved as long as the findings can be made to do the extension. And our assistant city attorney has more information about why we're doing that, and I think she's ready to talk about that if you have questions, but um, that's pretty much the main change that we're making to this section. And then finally, um, we're adding a new section regarding permit revocation to the code, and that specifies the grounds for revoking a planned development permit or a conditional use permit, and there's there are four different um, uh, situations where these permits can be revoked. And it's if approval was based on inaccurate or misleading information or one or more conditions of approval of the permit have been violated, um, if permit timelines have not been complied with or phasing has not occurred, and or if the permit involved a conditional use that's no longer active and has been abandoned. And so if a permit was going to be revoked, it would uh, go to a hearing with your commission and the decision to revoke the permit would then be appealable uh, to the city council. So th that concludes um, my presentation. I know there was a lot of information there, so if you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. And our assistant city attorney, uh, Ms. Whittem, is also here to assist, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dana. Uh, do we have any questions? I have a question. Go ahead, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Dan, I had some, uh, I'm having some challenges with some of the items for the ADUs. Um, trees, you know, you're talking about five, uh, a tree for every five lineal feet of the perimeter wall of an ADU. 
So if you have a twi you have a 600 square foot ADU, which is 20 by 30, how many trees are you going to have, and where do they go? Yeah, thank you, um, Chair Seifert and Commissioner Lopez. So um, that provision also has, uh, there's some flexibility within it where you could do even in like a larger plant, like 25 gallons. Um, also, you know, we understand that each, each project is unique. And so we would need to look at each one. If the ADU fell under that subdivision E section that I was mentioning, that a landscape requirement would not even apply. So it's really intended to apply for large, the larger ADUs that, um, uh, that are not being converted from existing space or, um, or the, like the smaller under 800 square foot ADUs. We, we can probably add some clarifying language to that um, item if, the, if you and the commission want to do that. And yeah, it's also not even, it's something that we added that uh, we thought would be helpful to um, just to add some landscape requirements and have the um, have them look a bit better. But again, it's it's your commission's uh, direction on whether to include that because we don't have that in there now. But, but where would they go? Um, it depends on the lot. The idea is that they would just go around the exterior of the. Um, of the building, so along the wall. Yeah, and they don't have to be trees. I think it says um, plants. I was gonna go to it in here. So it says at least one 15 gallon size plant shall be provided along every five linear feet of exterior ADU wall. So in between the ADU and, and the right of way, if it was near a, a roadway. So it doesn't have to be a tree, it can be any kind of plant. Okay. And then uh, secondly, the, the height. To, to do a two-story ADU in 16 feet and, and have it meet the objective standards, you can't do it because your roof pitch, I mean, you're going to have flat roofs everywhere. 16 feet, you're, you know, your eight-foot wall heights, one foot for the floor, another eight feet, you're at 17, and that's not even a pitch up on the roof. So you won't be able to meet the, the pitch of, the structure that's already there. So I, I think that we should probably stay with the zone that it's in because you're just gonna have flat roofs everywhere if, if, that's, if that's the max and we don't meet the 18 feet. Yeah, so that's your commissions. If you wanna bring that up, you can talk about that. I mean, we're 16 feet would probably be more of a single story structure. So if you were doing 16 feet, that would limit more than likely limit do the detached ADUs to one story. Um, but as it is currently, you can go, detached ADUs can go up to 30 feet in the R1 zone and um, 25 feet in the small lot zone. Okay, and um, let's see. So, so the objective standards come in for any ADU outside, sub, uh, upside, outside subsection E. So subsection E allows you to do up to three ADUs, one detached, one attached, and a conversion of space as a junior ADU. So that detached would fall under the, re the requirements of the objective standards if it goes over 800? Yes, so... Um the limited detached on the single family lot is one detached, and this is the subdivision E ADUs. It's one detached new construction ADU on a lot with a proposed or existing single family dwelling, and it's in addition to any junior ADU uh, that can be established, as well as the other one we talked about. So under that section, though, the floor area is, is limited to a maximum of 800 square feet. So in any um, detached ADUs that were constructed that were eight, under the 800 square feet would not trigger those development standards or, or objective design standards that I mentioned. And, and then just just for, for my clarification, ADU means junior ADUs. Um, I'm sorry. 
not, not that. Um, one more thing. Well, you know, there, there's some new legislation that passed in just last month, just October, that are that's going to go into effect January 1st. And this is one of the reasons I was asking, maybe we should have a study session on this, because I think come January 1st, we're going to have to, do we have to redo our ordinance? Or does that state law just automatically come into effect? Sorry, it's hard to make sure this is on. Um, so there were three different um, ADU bills that were signed by the governor. And I can, I'll just briefly touch on each one. Um, so there's AB 1332. Um, that requires local agencies by January 1st of 2025 to develop a program for the pre-approval of ADU plans um, where, so basically we have like ADU plans that are ready to go that an applicant could come in and select to use to build their ADU on their property. So by January of 2025, we do have to um, develop a program for that. That may require us to come back to make an adjustment to the ordinance, but it wouldn't be for quite some time. And I. I don't know that we necessarily would need to. It's something that would be more on the building side of things where we have those ADU plans that are pre-approved for use. Um, then there's AB 1033. That addresses allowing ADUs to be sold separately from the primary home as a condominium, but that bill is optional for cities. So uh, at this point, we're not um, proposing that the city um, do that, but it, it, it would be optional uh, to, to be undertaken to do that. And then AV 976 um, permanently removes the owner occupancy requirement for ADUs. Um, that was formerly set to sunset in 2025. And then it also um, modifies the short-term rental option prohibition to say that a local agency may require terms that are 30 days or longer. Um, that one, I'm looking at our assistant city attorney on that one. I just wanted to clarify. Um, I think the words, it gets a little tricky. AB 976, it didn't eliminate the owner occupancy requirement. It eliminated the sunset date on the owner occupancy requirement, which was gonna be at the end of 2024. So it will no longer sunset, it will remain. Um, we cannot allow owner occupancy with ADUs. With junior ADUs, we still have the requirement that the owner reside in one or the other. And then the other thing was a really small tweak that they changed it from 30 days or more to, uh, no, it was more than 30 days, and now it's 30 days or more or something, as far as um, you can limit um, that someone must live there for at least 30 days so these don't turn into short-term rentals, you know, for a weekend, a night here, a night there. So none of those um, impact our existing ordinance because we already had eliminated, or the proposed ordinance, because we already eliminated the owner occupancy requirement that's already been in our ordinance and it, it must remain under state law. Um, the, we're opting not to recommend that you be able to sell an ADU independently from the primary home. That's an optional thing for cities to consider. and then. Uh, Ms. Edie discussed the pre-approved plans. That's a whole um, process that we're going to have to develop and planning's going to have to come up with how that's going to be implemented. And we will, we will probably have to come back when that's ready to be rolled out. But we didn't want to hold this up because that might take quite a while. And these changes, some of these are already from a year ago. So we really need to get these in place. And it's, it's challenging when people read our ordinance and then when they come to the counter we tell them something different so we want to get our ordinance up to date thank you heather and then um then the the last question i did have was on the rents how, how do you guys get rent um, estimates on other dwellings that aren't adus Thank you, Chair, members of the Commission. Um, typically, we're only looking at rents when we're trying to determine 
if a unit is affordable or what level of affordability that unit rests at. That is typically only necessary when we're doing our general plan annual report. That's a report that we uh, send to both the Governor's Office of Planning and Research or OPR and we send it to uh, the State Department of Housing and Community Development or HCD. Um, that report looks at all aspects of the general plan including housing and how we've done in our housing production numbers. Um, I believe the Commission is familiar with RENA or our regional housing needs allocation and that's a certain number of homes that we are to facilitate the construction of uh, within a eight-year period. It's related to the housing element. That's a big portion of that annual report is reporting that RENA, how successful we were during the past year with meeting our RENA requirements. Those requirements are expressed in four different affordability categories, very low, low, moderate, and above moderate homes. So when we're reporting how many units we permitted, how many units we issued CFOs for during the prior year, we have to assign them to an affordability category. And that's where this new requirement's going to come in. The, in the past, what I've done is surveyed. We've done, we have done cold calling of ADU owners and just ask them if they would be willing to volunteer what rents they charge for their ADUs. And that's actually been fairly successful in terms of the uh, property owners willing to provide us that information. We've also done surveys of rental lists online, how much um, people are asking for their ADUs and so forth. That has satisfied HCD uh, when we've done our reporting in terms of doing our due diligence to as best we can determine which affordability level each of the units gets put in for our annual report to the state. Thank, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Dickerson, did you have questions? Questions? Commissioner Mohajer. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. Um, so, yeah, just to touch base on the rent reporting, um, and you did a great job in explaining as to why. Um, in terms of the implementation, um, once this is all passed, um, are you guys going to be providing notices to those um, ADU owners at some point? And is there going to be, you know, some type of reper repercussion if they don't provide that information to you guys at all? What does that look like? Yes, uh, Commissioner Mohajer. So um, currently in the ordinance, we have a requirement that um, as part of the building application, the applicant um, provides the city with an estimate of the projected monthly rent that would be charged for either the ADU or the junior ADU. And then within 90 days after September 1st of each year, after it's issued, then the owner reports the actual average monthly rent that's charged for the ADU or the junior ADU um, during the prior year. And so, if they do not send that to us, then we would be sending um, a notice of that, uh, that they needed to provide that information. And we, we would allow them 30 days to submit the report. And then if they fail to submit the report within the 30 day period, um, then we would have to take the next steps um, to contact them and, and try to get the information. Um, we have not, because this has been a draft ordinance and you know it still needs to be reviewed by your commission and then adopted by city council we haven't actually put a official program together on how we would uh, do do everything but um, the ordinance has those steps involved and so there would be um, additional work to be completed to basically set that process up if it gets adopted
Commissioner. <clears throat> uh, just as far as the uh, seven years uh, changes in the codes, uh, I know we have had some other projects, some commercial projects, they take a long time to do. It doesn't seem like an ADU uh, needs that particular, I mean, how do we continue that for forever? Like, uh, what about the code changes and uh, how does the city gonna get any revenue for the work they have to do for keeping up on the permitting and stuff? So huh? Chair Seifert, um, the seven year change is not actually applicable to ADUs. That's for plan development permits and conditional use permits. So that's the different section. It's a little confusing because I w presented the changes to the ADU s chapter first and then I had that separate chapter that changed the timing for um, those permits. Um, was that the question that you had about about the time extension? Or? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, what I was mentioning about getting rid of the seven year um, time limit, that's for plan development permits and <coughs> conditional use permits and ADUs are only, they're permitted through the building permit, so that wouldn't apply to ADUs. Okay, and then uh, I have to agree with Commissioner um, uh, Lopez on the heights. It doesn't make sense to me if we're going to be doing any two stories. I was doing the math in my head also, uh, probably the same time he was. That's it, 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 not really going to happen if we're going to do two stories. Uh, can we do something with that or thought so about that? So it really depends if your commission wants to allow for two-story ADUs, detached ADUs to continue. Um, if you do, then the state law allows the underlying zone district height to be applied to detached ADUs, but there is a, the ability for detached ADUs to be limited to one story. And so the updated code has that limitation in it. But if your commission wanted to go back to what we currently have and allow them to be two stories, um, you can do that. Thank you very much. Oh, Commissioner Dickerson. <laughs> um, uh, readdressing the uh, reporting of, uh, of rental properties uh, or the ADUs. Um, so uh, we've, we've talked about having an annual report of, of rents in the city to just see exactly where the rent is, is going. Could, could we actually require as part of uh, evidence are renters, or, or excuse me, are landlords required to do a business license for a, a single unit, and if that's what they, be it ADU or otherwise? My understanding, and, and um, we may have to get back and clarify this, but from my experience, um, business licenses are only required for uh, residential um, companies that operate multiple many units. Um, so you, you know what that number is? I do not know okay. what that exact number is. My understanding, however, is that a, a single single family property owner renting out an ADU or two or three ADUs uh, does not need to obtain a business license. But they, but they will need to, I mean, in the, in the ADU uh, stance, that they will need to report. Uh, okay, so I guess, and, and that's actually where I was getting at is, I mean, it, can we require, if we're requiring it of ADUs, can we require that reporting from any landlord? Or does it specifically have to be for ADUs? If we wanted to collect that information for our annual report, would we be able to do that? Uh, Chair, uh, Commissioner, um, the affordability, uh, so in the annual report, we're reporting on uh, single or units that have been issued a building permit and units that have been issued their final CFO. Uh, we essentially track it from uh, concept proposal uh, through the discretionary approval, through the building permit issuance, through inspections, and then to final CFO being issued. Um, we are now permitted by state law to credit ADUs towards uh, our RENA in, their, in our annual reports and in our housing elements. 
the other developments, the other units we're dealing with are most typically uh, part of a, a larger complex that's gone through a discretionary process where we've already established or the applicant and developer has already established whether or not it's going to be market rate units or is it going to be an affordable complex. If it's going to be an affordable complex, they're already communicating to us which levels of affordability and how many units and under each level. Uh, so in a way, we're already getting that reporting uh, through the discretionary permit process for affordable projects. It's these single units being permitted um, or these ADUs being issued a permit where we don't have that discretionary process to establish what the affordability level is. Um, that's where we were doing the surveys, uh, the uh, reviews of online sources and so forth because we were now able to report those ADUs. And yes, we were um, proposing to the state and we've documented in our past annual reports that ADUs are most typically affordable at some level, uh, either low or moderate. Um, so that's the reason why we're doing this special effort to collect that information regarding ADU permits where other projects typically go through a discretionary process and we get that information as part of the discretionary process. Right. But but I guess what I'm what I'm trying to find out is that we had we had discussed that there is a need we just talked about it within the last six months I would say that there is a need to understand the dynamics of how the how various projects are impacting the average, um, the various average rentals and rent prices. Is uh, it, by producing more and more units, are we really driving the prices down, or are we just producing more and more units that are at market rate and are continuing to go up? So we had discussed having an annual report um, internally for for the for the city not the arena numbers necessarily, I mean, obviously some of them are gonna have crossovers, but um, so the question I have is to create a more thorough um, report for the city and for, for this body, would we be able to ask uh, that of, or require that of, of all landlords or, or even if we wanted to limit it to landlords uh, of, uh, who have um, X or more number of of uh, of units so then we can start collecting that information i'm not talking about arena numbers i'm talking about for us thank you chair members of the commission um that would have to be something that we look into uh, i'm not sure of the ramifications we would probably be working with the city attorney's office on determining that yeah i'll just chime in um we can look into some kind of program, but as Mr. Alvaro said, there's not going to be any mechanism to make it compulsive because they're not coming in and asking for any kind of permit or anything. So we're not going to have like leverage over them to mandate it. Um, I do think we could maybe put to, you know, in working on our housing goals and our, you know, all the housing reporting, maybe there could be some voluntary survey type or reach out work that planning does to property owners in the city. Um, but I don't see a compulsory mechanism to force that reporting when they're not coming, you know, requesting a, a license or business license or a permit through community development. But, but there are a lot of things that we do as citizens that are uh, compulsory, <coughs> uh, uh, that are, uh, compulsory to us as citizens that the city applies to us that it's not that they have to get a building permit or this or that or everything, but that it's just in ordinance. There are things that they have to do. I mean, couldn't we just produce that as an ordinance that if you're renting that you can actually do that? We can look into that. Um, yeah. okay. I I'm not sure what that would look like. I have never heard of that. All right. Um, anyway, that's my question. Thank you. 
Commissioner Blanco. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I do have a question, actually, now that I look at this. Um, on the expiration for the um, plan development permits and conditional use permits, what, what was the reason before that we had a seven-year <clears throat> limit, and, and why now would we kind of eliminate that limit anyways? So you can blame me for that. Okay, it's your fault. <laughs> um, <laughs> so as Ms. Edie explained, under the previous ordinance and the existing, the proposed ordinance, you get three years um, in which to um, establish your permit. If you don't establish it within three years, then you can come request a uh, two-year extension. That's in the same in both ordinances. The reason we took out the seven-year max is because the courts have established that you have a property right in a use permit. It, it, it triggers then after that due process. So we cannot revoke or take away somebody's permit without giving them due process. The difference between the previous ordinance and this ordinance is, un in addition though, is under the previous ordinance, it was a little bit convoluted, but, and that's partly why we wanted to modify it because it didn't, it was a little bit unclear exactly how the process worked, but it says that the planning department brings forward requests for continuances. And under the revised ordinance, the applicant has three years to perfect their permit um, or request an extension. If they do not ex request an extension before the permit expires, the permit will expire. So it shifts the burden and the onus to the applicant. If your permit is expiring and you think you have grounds for an extension, you need to request an extension. So it clarifies that, which is great. If they request an extension, we then bring it to, and it's timely, we bring it to the Planning Commission, and you will have um, then to evaluate whether they can establish the two findings that must be made for an extension. And the two findings are that there's been adequate due diligence to implement and complete the permit, or that there are significant economic factors that justify additional time. And the onus is on the applicant to provide evidence to substantiate those findings. If you find that they've provided sufficient evidence, then you would extend the permit an additional two years. If you find they haven't, then you wouldn't. And they, under the rules of due process, we have to give them that opportunity unlimited. There's, I was com unable to find seven years anywhere in any law. So I'm not sure where, how that was originally set, um, but I'm not comfortable revoking permits without giving people due process. Also, the way it was written before, it was, cons the whole section was called reconsideration, yet it includes um, rev uh, time extensions and revocations. So we've split them out now, so it's very clear how the time extension process works and how a totally different process, we can revoke permits, you know, for all kinds of reasons. Someone isn't complying with the permit, with the conditions of approval. We've split it into two processes that I think are much more defensible and much easier for staff, staff to administer. So while the seven years is gone, I think the steps as we go are much more efficient and put more onus on the developer. And um, I know somebody asked me, well, um, when, we, when you're asked those findings, you know, it could just keep going and going. But I think if they've already, let's say, got a two-year extension, and then they come back two years later, they can't rely on the we did, we did at the last two-year extension. It's what have you done since the last two-year extension. And if they can show that they've diligently continued and started this, um, there's an example of a case where that involved a residential project that involved really complex financing through grants and HUD, and it got held up with that. And the body said, I don't see, you know, grading or sticks up, you know, you've done nothing. And they said, no, we've been in a two-year battle with the financing, and if you can establish that, then under due process, they get the extension. So hopefully that helps a little. Yeah. Thank you.
Expanding on that, what, what, was the se what was the second um, criteria? Are significant economic factors that justify additional time. So couldn't, in essence, virtually any developer um, get their plans put through and then sit on those plans and market that piece of property with plans and say, year after year, every two years, say, we are marketing it and nobody has given us the money that we are asking for it, there's your economic factor. They have just not been given a, an offer that's, that's sufficient for them. Couldn't, couldn't they just use that as a cut and paste line I don't forever? Think, I don't think you would need to continue extending it if that was the only justification given. I know we um, allowed permits to extend during COVID um, for instance, when, um, you know, everything kind of went nuts and people couldn't get their financing through and different things. So that was a justification we previously used. Um, I think just the fact that we can't sell something, I don't know. I don't think that that would be, um, require you to continue extending a permit indefinitely. So, so if somebody gave us that, that is their, their reasoning and we were up here making that decision as to whether or not it's um, whether or not we can revoke it or or we have to keep it and then we turn to you and say okay so legal says even though they've got this this is their economic reasoning you would you would sign off on that you would say yeah you guys can go ahead and revoke it is it's that right it's going to depend on the facts of the case I'll and they're it gonna is. <laughs> it's going to be the totality of all whatever the applicant provides to justify why they have or haven't done anything in the last two years or the previous three years, depending. We then will have to review what they're presenting and determine whether we think that it warrants an extension or not. It's going to be on a case by case basis. I can't tell you when we always would or we always wouldn't. Mm -hmm. The part seems a little squishy, but thank you. I understand mm -hmm. though. Any other questions? Uh, we're going to open this up to the public, and I do have a speaker slip. Lori, tomorrow. Lori, tomorrow, uh, Urban Planning Concepts. Uh, I appreciate the presentation in regards to time extensions. Um, I will give you a little historical context because it seems like we don't have it here. Initially, uh, the way the ordinance was written, there was no limitation on the number of time extensions a project could have. During uh, the last recession, which was a financial impact on development, the state provided a number of time extensions. I believe there was three different sets of time extensions that were granted. One was for two years, one was for 18 months, and then there was another two-year time extension because the recession lasted so long. So those were already granted by the state, the cities had to accept them. So when um, Peter Gilley um, came forward with a proposal to look at time extensions and how the state had taken control of the situation, um, and again, those were tolling provisions. So somebody might have had a three-year time extension on, or a limit on their map, and then you added the eight, and they still had the ability to apply for time extensions after that. So the, um, to rein that in, it was agreed upon to have a seven year limit. And um, that's the ordinance that went to the Planning Commission, went to the City Council, and I think it's been very successful because it allows projects to kind of go with the highs and lows of the economy. Um, I don't understand why it has to be so um, finite that we have to come up with a justification for economic factors. Right now, the economic factor that you will be hearing from some of the time extensions that will be coming forward is interest rates. And the fact that financing projects right now are, is very difficult. We may have several projects that uh, are ready to get permits, 
but they can't get financing. They've paid their money to do all of their development plans and their building permits and everything else, but they can't get financing. Um, I think the city of Santa Maria has been very respectful of development and realizing that to get through this process, to get through the hearings, to get through the environmental review is very costly to start with. And they've allowed projects to remain available for development, maybe beyond what the state law says, but it's been very accommodating. In our office, I think we only have four projects left that were from the 2007 era. <laughs> and um, they have gotten time extensions and we would hope that the city would recognize. And I don't think staff has explained, what happens if you say, and I'm sorry if I go over the time, but what happens if you say in three years, you don't have sticks in the air and there's no le legitimate reason for this time extension? Does that mean the project starts over again and we go through this whole process again? So I think that there needs to be a little bit more thought put into what's being recommended here by staff. Um, I do have one comment on the ADUs. Uh, the number 12, the one that you were having discussions on, I think is mistitled. Um, it says income re reporting. It, it doesn't say rent reporting. It says income reporting. And I think that except for things like people's self-help housing and some of the other projects that are legitimately low income or very low income, or there are those projects that have a portion of their properties that are um, getting bonus density because of a low income category. I don't know how you can justify having everyone report their income or either their income or their rent every single year. And I'm not, I'm reading the state law while we're talking and it doesn't say that. It says if they're dedicated to a particular program, there's reporting, but not every ADU or every junior ADU has to report. So I think that this particular section needs to be looked at a little bit closer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to speak? Going to go ahead and close the public comment, commissioners. Did we check Zoom? Could we check? Oh no, Zoom we did not check sure Zoom. There's no one there. Thank you. There's. We have some discussion. Motion. Thank you. I'm sorry. One additional quick question. So, for, regarding the ADUs, so with the with this new, under this new. Um, um, set of regs. Uh, have we increased the number of ADUs by one that can be on a piece of property? I'm trying to, uh, what's the maximum number that we, d we did allow and how many are we proposing to allow? So under that subdivision E section, Commissioner Dickerson, um, the state allows, if applicants can comply, up to three. So it's a, it's a junior ADU and an attached ADU that are converted from existing space within the primary residence. So you take like a room or rooms and convert that to your attached, <coughs> and then the garage might be the junior. And then it does allow you to also build a detached ADU of a maximum of 800 square feet. And so that's um, different. And, and the reason why that D different by by I mean by one by is that one, right? Yeah, okay, so it has increased the ADU has increased by, by one. one. Yes. Okay, that's what. And then, right. if I may, I, I did want to make just a, I did want to respond to Miss Tamura's comments just in one area. Um, so, the time extension um, changes that we're proposing actually remove that seven-year limitation and put in place a the ability to apply for time extensions every two years way past in the seven year mark, as long as those findings can be made. And they're the same findings that are currently in the ordinance. Um, and so it's, and it's an or, so it's either, um, and I think Ms. Whittem went over them, but it's that uh, 
it's funny, I had it just in front of me and then I changed the section, but it's the one, it talks about um, the economic factor, but then also that there's been some due diligence that's been done on the permit. So um, we're not making it, we're not saying that you, you can't continue to apply for time extensions. In fact, this makes it easier to continue to apply for time extensions. And then the other item um, she mentioned about income reporting, that can be changed to rental reporting if the commission would like to do that. And that is not a requirement in the state law. That's a requirement that we as the city um, added for our ordinance. Um, the state allows jurisdictions to add um, additional requirements, certain additional requirements. And so that's one that we're adding um, so that it, it, it assists us in getting that income information um, for our, our reporting for housing. Thank M you. Mr. Chair, if I may just, um, I feel the need to just make sure everybody understands. As Ms. Edie said, the revised ADU ordinance for the Section E state required ADUs does allow now the, um, a detached and an attached with a junior ADU, but that is a state mandate. That's not an option. So it's not like we can say, well, I just want to stick with our other one, our old one. Um, what actually happened is a very interesting story that's much too long for tonight, but the um, HCD actually has modified their interpretation of the law. And so that's why a lot of agencies are now modifying their ordinances to comply with their new interpretation. It seems that most of the things that we're looking at uh, say that it does comply with the new laws, uh, uh, except for the uh, income reporting. Um, most, of, most of the others, it says we're just basically going to comply with state law. Yeah, yes, Chair Siever, that's correct. And then we do have those additional objective design standards that we added that go beyond state law. But as I mentioned, those are only can only be applied to those ADUs that are not under that subdivision E. So the new larger over 800 square foot ADUs, we have those additional um, design standards that I went over in the presentation. And to be clear on this income reporting, we are talking about what they're getting charged for monthly rent, not what they're making or their income. Yes, that's correct. It's the it's the rental that they're receiving for the unit. And so that's why I, I agree we could change that to rental reporting, just to be clear. It's not the annual income of that particular owner. Yeah, and it, it does change to three families per lot now. So we're yeah, more parking and more issues. Um, okay, do we have a... Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just... I just any more conversation? Yes, sir. Oh, no. um, yeah, Dana, I had a question. So the the in, uh, encroachment in, <clears throat> into the front yard setback. So we don't have any guidelines. You're saying that this is something that we're going to refine once, if this gets approved, you'll refine it more, and then you'll you'll say how far into the front yard a percentage can go, or how how is that going to be determined? Uh, no, um, Commissioner Lopez. We just have to apply it as the law states. So it currently states that ADUs can encroach within that front yard setback if the setback itself keeps the owner from constructing an ADU of at least 800 square feet. What would be some of those, what, what could trigger that? Say you have a very, no room in the backyard or Yes, or topography, if you had a situation where maybe the, the backyard sloped up or there was already a structure in the backyard, um, then you could look at potentially doing it in the front yard. But there's other constraints that could come into play, like easements. Um, there could be street tree easements. There could be utility easements in the front yard. So um, I don't think we've had any of those come through yet because um, they can be difficult. But um, what it is intending to do is allow um, a property owner to maybe do an addition to the front of the house and kind of for the an, an ADU, like for an attached ADU, you could maybe do an addition. Um, and then if you needed to encroach slightly into that front yard setback, 
um, to make it large enough, you could look at doing that. But, but what is that slightly? What, what is that? The state law doesn't specify that. Can we specify or no? Um, I do not know. We cannot. So uh, they are case by case. It, it's not the, it was added in um, as one of the items that uh, basically you can't keep someone from constructing an ADU of at least 800 square feet on the property due to the front setback. There's some other um, provisions in the state law that are similar to that. Um, for example, uh, I'm going off memory here, but they added set the front setback to it, but there's also some of the uh, size limitations and the like the rear and side yard setbacks are four feet. Um, but if there's a, an existing accessory structure that's within that four feet, you can allow an ADU to go into that. So it kind of falls in under that um, section of the code. It's just not clear though, and there's not much information beyond what I stated in the state law. It's really just, you can encroach into it if you're not able to do it, an ADU of at least 800 square feet. Okay. All right, thank you. It's awful quiet. Well, I'll, I'll thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I think the, the height needs to go to the zoning that is uh, the underlying zoning because you're just going to have a lot of flat roofed um, two story ADUs. Or, I mean, you can. You could spend a lot of money and really make one that, that would comply to the 16 uh, foot height, but you're using steel and maybe containers. And, you know who knows. Um, so I'm I'm not I'm not um, in favor of the height uh, income reporting or rent reporting. I'm not in favor of that at all. Uh, and then I think that the the 15 gallon uh, for objective standards. I think every five feet. That's just a lot. I. I I'm not sure how much those landscape plants cost. They're not cheap, but by the time you add all those up, that's that's probably the cost of, of the appliances for the ADU. So um, I, I think it's too much of a requirement, especially if you're going to put them in the, the four-foot setback or in the five-foot setback, or because or, or, it's not really clear where you have to put it. It can just be anywhere or... or or do you guys want it in the front yard, or is that something that? So I, that that's just kind of my my three things with respect to this ordinance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Blanco. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the the uh, rent reporting is kind of interesting too. I, you know, I don't I don't know. Um, that that's necessary maybe maybe it's helpful i don't know but that seems a little bit odd and there's no requirement for, from the state or no current requirement <clears throat> um i'm not a big fan of that otherwise i think the other ones are okay i you know the question on the 16 feet um it seems like the intent really is to limit those to one story and maybe that's really the intent anyways because there's no way 16 feet i agree you're going to build two-story, so maybe that's the idea, and I think that that makes some sense. So I, I kind of, I think I'm okay with that, with that height requirement, um, and I'm not too sure about the the landscaping one. I, I, you know, that could be a little challenging. I, it seems a little odd. Maybe different configurations would require. So I, I'm assuming that that wouldn't matter if you have a ADU in the back corner of your lot and you have fencing all the way around and it's already screening the the AD or it would be screening the ADU maybe just in a case where you have it along the front so you're screening from the street is that kind of the idea yes that's correct it mentions in the ordinance um, in between it's along the exterior ADU wall in between the ADU and the right-of-way. And then it does say alternatively larger size plants like a 24 inch box could be provided for every 10 linear feet. So it is intended for ADUs that um, are up against a, a street or where there's a right-of-way. Sure, okay, all right, thank you. Those are my comments, thanks. 
Commissioner Mahajan. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I kind of have to agree with the um, the rental um, report annually. I mean, I feel like it would be fine at initial onset um, the first year, but maybe, you know, to not to have to carry it on annually thereafter. Um, other than that, I feel like everything pretty much complies with state law, and so I don't really have any other problems. Thank you. Commissioner Dickerson. Hell yeah, issue, isn't it? Yeah. Um, let's see. As far as the uh, the the um, the rental um, reporting, I, I I don't have a problem with it, but I I think I think where people are nervous about it is that if you can you know put X rent or rentals on someone's specific doorstep, and I I think that I think the the information is useful uh, to the city and it would probably be useful to us at some point down the road, but not necessarily if we could uh, if we could have some sort of anonymity um, or some sort of information where we do get it annually, but you know um, it's it's all part of an enormous mix versus um, these guys are doing this and these guys are doing that and this. I think I think that that would be a uh, a more palatable way of doing the the information and once again rental versus income um i i i cannot express any more than i have many many times in the past my um uh, disdain for what sacramento is doing to uh to our way of life and um adding more adus um impacts impacts the the, the residents uh okay. certainly residents who have lived in an area a long time and adus are then popping up versus new uh new developments um you know at least with new developments the uh the residents have their own choices um as to whether or not they want to to live in a in, in a impacted area like that but having this inflicted upon uh, upon our residents is just um, it's unconscionable um, so those are my opinions and I do recognize that it is not us it is Sacramento I mean I I get that I, I didn't but um, there we go that's what I have to say hey, Commissioner well I have to agree that having three families on one lot residential lot is uh, uh, not my idea of a, of a good plan Oh, it's gone to four now. So that's that, that's what I, I thought it was before, and then I was corrected. Um, but the, but the fact of what we're doing here is just it's kind of crazy. Uh, the fact that Sacramento is asking us to do this, uh, the income reporting. I'm not a fan of that, whether it's rental or income. Uh, the height. Uh, if someone has a very small backyard and they want to put on what's a, a 1,200 square foot detached ADU, um, they've got to have. 1,200 square feet on their backyard to do that with. So I guess that's, uh, yeah, it, it, I guess the council has to decide if we want two stories or not. So if it's small backyards, or they could get, uh, they could actually meet the 1,200 square foot uh, and, and build up to that size. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's not going to happen at the 16 foot height. And I think we do need to tweak the landscaping uh, just a little bit to make it a little bit clearer as to what we're asking for. Um, seem to be a lot of questions basically you know we go with 15 percent or 20 percent on other projects they meet that requirement we go from there this we're being very specific about size and plant uh, i'm sure that can be tweaked in a way that it uh, it, it, it satisfies what you're trying to accomplish uh, with this ordinance that's it for me do we I'm just asking. Well, a 15, uh, 15 How big gallon? a 15 gallon is it? It's yeah. the, about that tall, about that round? Uh, yeah, I believe so, yes. It's not the huge ones. So at this time, do we want to make a resolution? Someone? Yeah, 
Yeah, I'll uh, Commissioner Blanco. I mean, I'll uh, by resolution recommend that the City Council approve zoning text amendment Z 2023-0001 with the revision to remove the income reporting standard or rent or income. I guess it's income right now, but income reporting standard. Oh, it's on. Do we have a second? Second. Can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Commissioner <laughs> Mohajer? Aye. Commissioner Dickerson? I'll abstain. Commissioner Lopez? Uh, no. Chair Seifert? I'm going to go no. Where are we at? It doesn't pass. It's just Sounded like two yeses, two noes, and an abstain. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is a. Well, they're actually, that's a very interesting legal <laughs> conundrum because an abstention, unless it's for a financial conflict of interest, counts towards the majority, counts towards. Counts as a yes, I believe. Then, but I, then I vote no. The per, perhaps I think the best thing to do, obviously um, there's concerns about the sections that were highlighted. Um, I would propose that um, we go back to planning and, and my office as well, look at the sections that were clearly brought up during the discussion, the landscaping, the height, the um, the rental component, um, you know, we can go back, listen to the tape, all the concerns that were raised, and then we can bring it back after we've had a chance to go over that. That's what I'm because we have we have in essence a tie with the two two and the abstention. Do we uh, take the vote again to do that very thing? How do we handle that? Um, if you want to take a five minute break, I maybe can have a better answer for you. Looks like we're going to take a five minute break.
Okay, we're getting ready to get started again, guys. He's right here. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, let's get back in session. And uh, Heather, do you have something for us? Yes, thank you very, very much to the commission, to the public for indulging me in that. I went back and have some did additional research. Um, the nuance that I was thinking of is that um, it has to do with a quorum. So if you have a financial conflict of interest, you don't count towards a quorum. Um, but if you just abstain because you have other reasons that aren't financial, you count towards a quorum. So I think I got a little bit confused in that. Uh, it doesn't mean that you are a yes or a no. So we come back to two yeses, two noes, that's a tie vote, the motion does not pass, the motion fails. So nothing has happened. Dan uh, Ms. Edie and I talked during the break and perhaps she can um, go over some of the concerns that you had with the ADU ordinance that were articulated and possibly come up with some suggested revisions that the majority of you could, could agree on. So if you'd like to indulge, indulge her to do that, she can do that. Otherwise, um, it just fails and we won't have accomplished anything. I'm sure that the commission would like you to do that, Dana. No, ch Chair, well, I think, wouldn't, wouldn't we just rather take this back to a study session and hash this out through study session rather than continuing it? That is one resolution. Can, can we set up something for that? It's always better to talk these things out. We can, although I, I would like to go over the recommendations that I uh, was going to mention, and then maybe we can decide. Um, also, you do have a couple of different revisions in front of you tonight. One of them is on the ADU section, but there's a separate resolution that addressed the time extensions and the included the revocation. And we did pre prepare separate resolutions on those, so you could act on one and not the other tonight if you wanted to. But what I was going to recommend um, regarding the concerns with the height, um, the ADU law does allow you to go up to 18 feet as I mentioned, if you're near the high transit corridor area. So um, you could revise it to say, to, to go with the 18 feet. And then there is a provision to address the, the roof pitch issue that was brought up that allows for two additional feet um, to accommodate a roof pitch that um, aligns with the pitch of the, of the primary dwelling unit. So you could get 20 feet and that's still below the maximum height limit of the zone so that still could be within reason of um, the the size and uh, the type of of a unit that you might see as a second unit or an ADU um, so that was what I was going to mention on the height we can definitely strike the um, income reporting item that is something that we added that we thought might be helpful but if it's not the commission's uh, um, if the commission would not like to have that in there, that's fine. We can, we can take that out. And then we can also uh, make uh, some minor tweaks to the, the landscaping item that Commissioner Seifert brought up um, before we take it to city council, just to clarify where those, um, plant, where those plants would need to be located and make it a bit clearer. So those are the three items that I was going to mention that we could change. Are we saying we're changing those tonight and we're going to take another vote? Yes, you if your commission would like to do that, I can make those changes um, with the vote, as part of the vote. I'd say we give that a try. <coughs> do I hear a resolution? Mr. Chairman, can I, can I say something? Yes, sir. Yeah, I just, be, because w one of the other ones was that front yard setback. I, I just, I, it just, it's so, it's, it's just not clear. I, I mean, do we say, I, I know you, you mentioned if it can't be built anywhere else on, on the property, you're going to be able to 
to build it into the front yard setback, it, I mean, how how can you, I guess you, you, you mentioned you can't limit how far it can encroach. And, and that's, for me, that's, you know, you, you want to keep your, your neighborhoods looking like neighborhoods, but it, if you're going to encroach into that front yard, it's just, how do you? Commissioner Lopez, there is, I may have misspoke, and I'm sorry about that if I did, but the state law allows ADUs to go into the front yard setback now. So um, they can encroach into the front yard setback, and um, in most instances, if there isn't a easement or something like that, not allowing it to happen, it, it could happen. Um, if, and it, as I mentioned, it's about the 800 square foot size of ADU. So even in a study session, I wouldn't have more to add on that because the state law doesn't allow us to um, make it any, add any more restrictions to that or add any more to that. It's basically that it can encroach into that area. And that's what other, I, I've been following other jurisdictions and what they've been, uh, the changes they've been making to their ADU ordinances and um, the same thing. Wow, okay. All right, th thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Blanco, where are you going to? Um, well, I'm, I guess I'm not clear as to the height uh, revision that we're proposing. Because um, right now, the, the way it was being proposed was just to use the current state law requirement, right? So how are we going to deviate from that? Maybe I, I just wasn't clear. So there's options with the height. <clears throat> So the state law allows you to do the underlying zone district, if you would like, which we currently have, or you jurisdictions can change that. So 16 feet is the minimum you can apply. You can also go to 18 feet if you would like. So originally I had proposed 16 feet, which would pretty much limit it to a single story detached ADU. Um, you could go to 18 feet with an additional 20 feet to accommodate the roof pitch, and that would allow for a two-story ADU, which is what we allow now. We allow two-story detached ADUs now, and you can build up to the either 30 feet or 25 feet, depending on which residential zone you're in. So um, the change would just be, it would go down to 18 feet with, a, with 20 feet for the roof pitch. That would be the new one. Or you can keep it the way it is now, which is, a two-story ADU as well. So there's what, options. <laughs> what, are, what are the limitations on an R1 zone? What, what are the height limitations there? Uh, it's currently, it's 30 feet in the R1 zone. So it'd be going from a 30-foot detached ADU down to an 18-foot detached ADU. Okay. Thank you. Commissioners, of course. Uh, thank you, Chairman Seifert. Uh, the attached ADUs, they can go up to 25 feet. They could be anywhere on the on the footprint of the uh, on the footprint of the existing dwelling or adjacent is attached, right? Attached is uh, yeah, attached to the primary dwelling unit. But that that doesn't have to be existing space. No, you can uh, you could build an um, you could build an addition to the home, and then convert that to an ADU. Or you can build yeah you can build a new ADU attached to your home, and that at that's, 25 feet. Yes, that's how it currently we currently have it as well. There's no change to that. Okay, All right. thank you. Currently, we're not moving this along. Would anyone like to try again? I'd like to make a motion that we um, pull this back and uh, take it to study session since we clearly don't have any support to, to, to move this thing forward as it's been discussed. I think it just needs more discussion by us. So that's my, that's, that's what I propose. Do I hear a second? Mr. Chairman, I'll second that. Can we have a roll call, please? 
Commissioner Dickerson. Do, do we need to, I'm sorry, do we need to come up with a um, study session date? Or do you want to leave that at your discretion? Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to leave that at, at our discretion because okay. I don't know that I'll be able to do this t to the end of the year. It'll probably be next year, the beginning of the year. Okay. Sorry. Commissioner Dickerson? Aye. Commissioner Lopez? Aye. Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Commissioner Mahajer? Aye. Chair Seifert? Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the next item, number 5A, zoning text amendments for accessory dwelling units, time extensions, and permit revocations. Nope. Salas Trucks 5B, Salas Truck and Trailer Storage Plan Development Permit and Conditional Use Permit at 2926 Industrial Parkway. I believe we're going to continue this item. Uh, were you going to? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I have to recuse on this item. I have I, a financial conflict. The applicant is a client of my employer. We're going to continue this. Does she have to leave the room at this point? Could you please? Thank you. Staff? Thank you, um, Chair Seaford and Commissioners. So yes, staff is requesting that this item be continued to a future um, hearing date. We don't have a date established yet. We need to do some additional uh, CEQA review for environmental review. Um, and so we are requesting to do that. We have communicated this to the applicant and um, they understand the need to do that and are here tonight. Um, so uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I get a motion? Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have public comment. What? This is an item on our agenda, so um, we do have to open it up to public comment. Hopefully the public <coughs> comment will be limited to the <coughs> request for a continuance since we're not going to, it appears we're not going to have the full staff report, presentation, and discussion on the item, uh, but they are entitled to their um, opportunity to speak. I have no slips. Do we have anyone on Zoom? We have no public input. Bring it back to the commission. Do I hear a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we continue solace truck and trailer storage plan development permit, conditional use permit at uh, 2926 Industrial Parkway. And that is uh, PD 2022-003 for a continuance. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passed. Thank you very much, Commissioner. This time we're going to move on to item 5C, Blosser Ranch Single Family Plan Development Permits and Tentative Track Maps at the southeast corner of Blosser Road and Stoll Road. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I will recuse myself to stay consistent um, along with all the other um, recusals for potential uh, financial conflict. So I will recuse myself from this item. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We have a staff presentation, please. Thank you, Chair Seifert, members of the commission. My name is Carol Zizenheni. I'm a senior planner presenting the Blossom Ranch single family residential, um, vesting tentative tract maps and plan development permits. Yeah. Okay. So this project has, um, so th these are two plan development permits and two vesting tentative tract maps for subdivision of lot four and lots nine and 11 of tract 6022, known as Blossa Ranch, into two separate single family residential subdivisions. These projects were reviewed by the Planning Commission at, a, at two study sessions, one on April 7th, 2022, and on October 5th, 2023. So your commission will be familiar with this project site as you've seen several projects uh, four to be exact come through your commission 
This project site is located at the northeast corner of Battles Road and Blossa Road. The site itself in, within the specific plan area is 145 acres and is currently utilized for agricultural production. Surrounding development to the, to the site includes single family homes to the north, south, and southwest surrounding here, Manami Park to the east, and industrial development to the northwest. Santa Maria Fairgrounds and Santa Maria High School are to the northeast as well, and Santa Maria Valley Railroad borders the site to the east and is adjacent to Depot Street. This is the zoning of the Blossom Ranch area five or Blossom Ranch tract, and this is in the Blosser Southeast Area 5B specific plan. So this is the zoning for the specific plan area. We've gone over the other uses on in the specific plan area, but for those who are unfamiliar, there is a six or 19.6 acre open space designated for a sports future sports field, a future school in this public facilities district on 23, 23 acres, and then a two acre fire station with commercial over 10 acres in the remaining 10 acres. The multifamily areas here have all received plan development permits. And so one uh, single family property did also receive uh, approval. So the, these are the two remaining. This is the master tract map, which shows those projects that are highlighted in the yellow showing the, the site plans, and then on the right, uh, highlighted in red are the two project sites before you this evening. This slide on the right shows the full build out potential of the Blossa Ranch um, project, including the, the school, the sports fields, and the commercial. I don't believe that there's that fire station shown. This was an early rendering before the applicant um, agreed to provide that area for the fire station. Uh, lo lots eight and, and ten, which are the which is the other single-family subdivision, did receive planning commission approval in late 2022 to construct 105 for-rent single-family residences with 96 accessory dwelling units. Uh, to date, as I previously mentioned, three apartment communities and that subdivision received entitlements for a total of 937 approved residential units. With the projects before your commission tonight, if approved this evening. The total build out would be 1,492 units. So to begin, I'll start with lot four, which is outlined with the, the blue arrows. This is where it is located in the rendering. And then outlined in red on the left-hand side is the, the, the area located on the northwest corner of La Brea Avenue and Western. So the subdivision would create 59 lots to construct 58 single family dwellings and a clubhouse and the, the streets and common amenities. All of the single family lots would include a detached ADU to be approved separately through building permit. Primary access would be off of Western, which would be um, entry and exit, and then an exit only off of La Brea. Consistent with lots eight and 10, all of the roads are private, 24 foot wide with no on-street parking, but there are designated parking spaces throughout the subdivision. And I'll go into those in a future slide. These are the house styles and plans. Lots eight and 10, the prior project was proposed with a Spanish Mediterranean style. This project proposes a craftsman style with the horizontal, lap siding, um, other exposed rafters, window boxes, shutters, and with a, a variety of a color scheme. The applicant has additional figures to show you in their presentation. And th this is a sample showing the colors and materials, um, both to provide additional variety between the different models and the different units. There are two different types of roof material as well as some variation to allow for some stone along the base on the pillars um, which is consistent with the craftsman architectural style 
And this is a sample elevation showing the single family dwelling, the two story single family dwelling. There is an ADU with a corresponding architectural style matching colors and um, roof pitch, for example. The, the other elevations are available in the staff report packet. So for brevity, I'm just gonna keep it with this one elevation. The applicant, similar to the previous lots eight and 10 um, proposal, they are requesting three develop modifications to development standards. The, these are reductions to allow for architectural um, features in compliance with the specific plan or to provide the much needed um, ADU parking, which is not required by state law, but is a, a courtesy provided by the applicant. So number one is an encroachment into the um, required 50% landscape um, landscaping in the front yard. This is to accommodate the, the Hollywood style driveway, which your commission um, worked with the applicant on for lots eight and 10. Number two is a reduction in the front yard setbacks uh, for a living area of the home, which is to meet the specific plan requirement of a um, the garage being set back six feet from the main living area of the home for additional architectural interest along the street frontage. And then thirdly is a one, one lot does not comply with the city standard for a site distance triangle. It's a right angle triangle. I'll get at that into that in more detail in the future slide. So this is just a reiteration of the previous slide showing the um, 50 put 50% paving in the front yard setback area. The applicant is requesting um, to allow 54% of the front yard to accommodate that Hollywood style drive, which adds parking for the ADU in the front yard. So total, the this modification allows for six on-site parking spaces, which will take take out of the equation um, parking conflicts and the need to park on the street and kind of fight for your own parking space. The, the second modification is for that encroachment on the slide here is showing the primary living area set back to 15 feet. And then uh, the porch area, which is allowed by code, is in, is a set to the front another six feet. And this is, again, to comply with the specific plan requirement of setting the garage back and putting prominence at the main entry of the home. And then thirdly, this is showing the city standard on the, the bottom right, the city standard corner cutback, which does require a right angle um, site visibility triangle. There is an alternate um, design standard that the engineering division of, of our public works department has reviewed for this um, application. As shown on the top left, these are the Caltrans um, design manual intersection standards, which allow for, um, it takes into account the vehicle speed and visibility distance. So if, if one would, were to stop at this line here, they could look to the left and see oncoming traffic and vice versa, if someone was to stop in this hatched area, they'd be able to look beyond the house to an oncoming vehicle approach. Um, as this is a, a not a through street, there's only two other houses here. Engineering re has reviewed this and is comfortable with this modification. This is the only site distance modification request for this subdivision. The applicant has a much more in-depth um, discussion about the amenity area package. Um, it is robust and provides a community building with a pool, spa, tot lot. They, they'll go more into depth with that, but this is uh, some character images and a view of the floor plan and, and amenity package. I would also like to mention that there are multiple pedestrian entryways. The applicant will, will touch on that in their presentation. Um, two entryways at the main entrance. There's one additional uh, pedestrian gate on La Brea and Western, and then on this exit onto La Brea as well. The project proposes one street tree per single family lot consistent with 
city standard. A condition of approval has been incorporated um, for the applicant to work with Recreation and Parks Department staff to ensure adequate street tree planting and that the trees are planted to city standard and are maintained. Any trees to be removed are required to be approved by Recreation and Parks staff, so they shouldn't be removed without first checking with the city. So that concludes my presentation for lot four. Um, I, I'm just going to pause here at the um, to defer to the the chair as to whether there's any questions of the commission or if I can continue with my presentation. Open to either. Commissioners, please continue. All right, thank you very much. So moving right along to lots nine and eleven, this project is again shown similar with the other project. It's bottom right hand side fronting along battles and joining up to the sports field. Um, left it's highlighted in red. This is a proposal on 27.05 net acres and this is composed of lots 9 and 11. So there's two, two projects that are going to be split into 176 single-family lots for the construction of 175 single-family dwellings and a common lot for the um, amenity package, the community building, etc. So the lots would range in size between 4,000 square feet and 5,300 square feet approximately. The density would be 6.5 units per acre, which is below the eight dwelling units per acre maximum for the R1 zone. 168 of these lots would include space for a detached ADU, so not every lot is proposed to have an ADU. Some are too small to accommodate those. The roads consistent with the other single family projects are 24 feet wide and are private. And similar to the access on the other single family lots, there is one uh, entry and exit along Western and then one exit only along La Brea. So this project, lots 9 and 11, are proposing a few more modifications than the previous um, lot 4. It's a larger subdivision, um, but the th three, the th three in first modifications are consistent with the other two projects. Um, reduction to allow that Hollywood style drive for ADU parking. The reduction in the front yard setback to allow that architectural feature and street, street interest. And then for this project, there is a modification for 12 of the lots, um, which do meet that Caltrans site distance um, mod, uh, figure that engineering division has approved and accepted um, for 12 of the lots. And then um, finally, this I believe this was um, a modification for lots 8 and 10. This is a reduction in the side yard corner setbacks for 10 lots. These are for the single family only. There are no ADUs proposed on um, a majority of these lots, and I'll get into that in the next slide. And these, this, the number four modification is to accommodate um, additional 90 degree parking, um, which is uh, a priority of, of the commission in prior conversations for lots eight and 10. So I'm gonna show this project in, in two separate slides because this is a lot to fit in one, one screen. This is the northerly portion of the site which has most of the modifications. So outlined with the blue star is those um, line of sight calculations according to Caltrans standards rather than the city standard. This it does meet the um, city state safety requirements for stopping and, and visibility. And then located on these middle blocks are the single family homes um, without an ADU. They're longer and narrower, but they have been shifted over to allow for these 90 degree parking spaces on um, either side of these blocks here. There are a couple of other, um, two more lots that aren't shown in these central areas um, and that'll be on the next slide I believe there's a couple more here 
um, one at the entrance and then one more elsewhere on the site. So this is the southerly portion of the site. Throughout, again, there are um, additional guest parking areas in addition to the six on-site, off-street parking for each, each unit with the ADU. Additionally, there are um, pedestrian accesses on, not shown here, but on a, on a future slide, there, there's pit access into the um, linear park along Battles Road. So this project is proposed with the modern farmhouse style that was seen on lot three for the multifamily. It is um, consistent with the, the specific plan requirement um, for uh, variation in, in architectural style. These, um, these units are a little bit taller to accommodate the uh, steep standing seam roofs that are um, consistent with the far modern farmhouse style. There are five different types of color schemes and I'll get into a, um, a few of the future uh, model floor plans and, and get into that a little bit more since that wasn't presented in, in the lot four. This is a view, uh, a rendering of these model homes with a board and batten siding vertical standing seam roofs, uh, large windows to let in sunlight, and then varied garage door patterns as well as the, the front porch um, with additional materials incorporated throughout. So I'll, I'll just briefly um, scroll through these floor plan models. This is uh, the most common for its uh, four bedroom, 3.5 bath. This is showing the ground floor in the center. On the left-hand side is the second floor, showing four bedrooms and three baths. And then on the ground floor, there's a half bath. And then this is showing the, the roof. These are the three bedroom designs. Um, I will note that there is a modification to the front porch, which will allow for additional um, visibility on the corner. This is a, a, an overhang for the entryway rather than a columned um, typical porch. This is just to uh, ensure adequate sight distance on those corners. And then third is the corner uh, three bedroom 2.5 bath which does not propose an ADU. So in the middle again is the ground floor with a half bath and then three bedroom and these two baths here. With similar to the other projects proposed with Lost Ranch, there is an extensive amenity package that the applicant will get into in further detail. On the on the right hand side is showing the community building area with all of the amenities, barbecues, uh, spa, lounges, um, hot lot with shade. And then consistent with the other single family subdivisions, one tree is proposed per lot with uh, recreation and parks oversight over the, the tree planting and maintenance, continued um, preservation of these trees. This is the southerly portion of the site. Additional trees are proposed in these public areas as well within the parks the pet wash, and then this, this figure does show some pedestrian access. There's a couple doors here which lead out onto the um, linear park along battles. There are um, a handful of condition revisions that staff has prepared on this slide. There's just some minor cleanup items to adjust verbiage and to clarify some requirements at the time of building permit prior to occupancy. So additions are outlined with an underline and in purple, and um, removals are with a strike through in red. Um, just going down the list, there's a, um, a vesting tentative tract maps are not recorded, but a final map is, so that addresses 
conditions 4 and 33B. There's a duplicate condition which staff is requesting to be removed, and then additional language about um, bonding for um, sewer improvements prior to occupancy, which is consistent with other single family developments. This is just incorporated for additional clarification. And then finally, for consistency between the plan development permits and the track map regarding street trees, there is an additional condition for prior to occupancy, the developer will obtain approval from the urban forester on the species and location of the front yard tree to be planted within the front yards of every individual lot. And the responsibility for maintenance and replacement will be borne by the developer or future owners if, it's, if the lots are to be sold separately. And then developer and owners of the individual lots will be pro prohibited from removing such trees unless a replacement tree has been approved by the city. And then very consistent, um, these are the same changes, but for lot four, the previous was for lots nine and 11, with just different differences in um, the condition numbers. The project was adequately covered in a previously adopted final supplemental environmental impact report with the state clearinghouse number shown there on the screen, uh, pursuant to California Environmental Quality Act guidelines, section 15162, and no further environmental review is required for these projects. So with that, that concludes my presentation. Staff recommends that the Planning Commission take the following four actions. By resolution, approve tentative tract map TR 2023-0001 for lots nine and 11. By resolution, approve tentative track map TR 2023-0002 for lot four. By motion, approve plan development permit PD 2023-0002 for lots nine and 11, as re revised in the staff presentation. And finally, by motion, approve plan development permit PD 2023-0007 as revised in the staff presentation, and this is for lot four. Thank you, and the applicant is available with a presentation as well. Thank you very much, Carol. Do we have any ex parte? I don't believe I have either. Um, do we have any questions for staff? Can we have the applicant, please? State your name and address for the record. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Tama Kimini with uh, Canfield Development. Um, with the Blossom Ranch project. Um, first and foremost, thank you for taking the time to um, listen to my presentation and to hear our project. Um, and thank you to uh, city staff, all the city staff from the various departments for working to, with us to bring this project forward. Um, we think this is an extremely a, 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 a project that is extremely beneficial to the community and will provide uh, good quality housing um, to the community at all the different various uh, income levels. I think we start with four. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to follow the same um, uh, pattern as um, Carol um, in terms of pre presenting. So we'll present lot four first, and then we'll go into lots nine and 11. Um, I, I think we'll skip the first couple of slides, which talk about the area which uh, Carol covered substantially. Um, and uh, this next slide just uh, it's, uh, lo locates where lot four is located. It's uh, highlighted and bordered in yellow. Um, it's, ba it's bounded by La Brea and Western Avenue. Um, this is just a list of the various uh, infrastructure that would go in, which is the balance of all the infrastructure associated with Area 5B. Um, and you can see that it's uh, directly adjacent to the future fire station and retail uh, to one side and, and adjacent to Lot 2, which is a multifamily development off of uh, La Brea and, uh, and, and, and uh, Stowell Road. 
Um, for the public amenities, just to refresh everyone's memory, um, that there's a 19-acre uh, new sports complex. The uh, us as the developer went into an MOU with the city um, to exchange this uh, piece of land uh, for no money's being exchanged. This is just an exchange for uh, future. Um, uh, uh, park fees associated with the project or Quimby fees, so that achieves no out-of-pocket cost to the city uh, for the land. Additionally, there is a two-acre new fire station um, located on the commercial parcel. Uh, this was added post uh, the tentative track map being approved or the overall map being approved. Um, but you know, we, we understood the need from the Santa Maria Fire Department and added that two-acre fire station, which is in the exact location that the, that was requested by the fire department. Um, and uh, that's located on the screen, uh, highlighted in red, right off of um, La Brea and, uh, and, and Blosser Road. Uh, there's also a 23-acre new park uh, planned for this community. We're in talks with the, um, the school district to continue planning for that development. Um, so a project overview, um, lot four is the third single family development, or in this case, in, in the order of my presentation, the second uh, single family development for Blossom Rancher Area 5B. Um, when designing the balance of our single family neighborhoods, we tried to stay as consistent as possible with everything that we've reviewed with the Planning Commission on lots eight and 10. Um, so you'll see as I go through this presentation, a lot of the standards are exactly the same um, as what we've discussed on lots eight and 10, what was approved on lots eight and 10, uh, making a lot of those changes to match. Um, there are a few different uh, amenities that we try to sprinkle in on this specific lot as we try with every single community to have a little bit of differentiation. Um, so this community will be mapped for flexibility as a potential for sale product, but it's currently planned as a rental product. Uh, the community will consist of 59 lots, 58 of which will include an ADU um, with a one large lot for the uh, uh, open space and the community building. This is a professionally managed private gated community. Um, we'll go through the amenity package shortly um, and you'll see the complimentary pocket parks and green spaces that we're providing um, in this neighborhood. This is also a green community which includes solar on every home and ADU. Uh, there's also EV charging that will be installed and provided for both the main home in the garage as well as uh, the tandem parking spots provided for the ADU. So every single resident will have um, the ability to charge their vehicle on their uh, uh, on their lot itself and in, th in their parking spaces. Additionally, beyond that, there'll be um, EV chargers for guests uh, at some of the uh, guest parking spaces uh, throughout the site. So to go through some of our amenity package, on the right side of the screen, you'll see a, a rendering of the community building uh, for this specific neighborhood, which includes consistently, you know, uh, com uh, uh, consistent with all, our, all of our other neighborhoods that we've presented here, a lounge and family area, a children's study session that was added at the request of the commission, um, a game room, private dining, chef's kitchen, uh, a fitness center with showers, a business center, uh, bike storage and repair center. The leasing and management office would be located in this building as well, as well as a package delivery center. Uh, this is just a bird's eye view of some of the uh, outdoor amenities located around the clubhouse. So it includes a pool with a Baja shelf, a spa, uh, some cabana seating, some chaise lounge seating with uh, some additional shaded structured areas. Uh, there's also outdoor an outdoor barbecue um, with some outdoor dining areas. Um, to the left of the clubhouse, you'll see a, a, a tot lot with some shade uh, provided. There's also some short-term bike parking provided. If you know a child wanted to bike from his home to uh, the clubhouse, they can you know, short-term uh, park their uh, bike directly in front of the clubhouse. And you'll see some photos, um, which in just include some inspiration of what, the, of what the future development would look like. Uh, some other pocket uh, park uh, areas we have on the right side of the screen um, as you continue past the, uh, the clubhouse, we provided additional gathering space for um, outdoor seating, outdoor lounge areas with a barbecue, Santa Maria barbecues. Um, and one thing we were able to add specifically for this project, just simply because of the way that the corner of this lot uh, ended up working out, is a little putting green. If someone wanted to practice their, um, their golf, they can go ahead and use that putting green uh, uh, located at number 11 on the bottom part of the screen. Um, and then to the left side of the screen, you'll see we have our uh, pet runs. Um, 
you know, some of our other neighborhoods we're seeing that some of the residents are requesting to have two separate pet runs, one for a smaller pet and one for a larger pet. Um, so we've incorporated that in uh, this development as well, uh, providing a smaller area for smaller pets with um, you know, a, a pet wash station um, and some, uh, 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 some waste stations as well and, and bag waste stations. Um, and then the same for that larger pet run for some of the larger uh, pets. We have one more outdoor uh, area here. This is uh, consistent with our Zen spaces that kind of we've been showing throughout the um, throughout the entire Blossom Ranch. It has a, a grass turf area for some outdoor play and outdoor lounging. There's uh, some uh, outdoor seating as well if someone wanted to work from home. We've thrown in another barbecue um, here again to provide that flexibility to have multiple gathering spaces um, within uh, the neighborhood happening at the same time. And uh, it's accented with multiple um, uh, you know, the landscaping and uh, string lights like you see on the screen. Um, there's also um, at our main entry, um, just to the back of the main entry, we had a little opportunity there to add an additional seating area. So we provided some additional seating um, with, uh, with, with umbrellas and, uh, and, and tables and chairs for you know, someone, again, wanted to work, who's working from home, wanted to work outside to get some fresh air, they can use that space as well. Um, there's also a, a water feature located at the median um, at the entry gate of our project, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, so for community parking, it was covered adequately by uh, Carol, but I'll just run through it one more time. So on each lot, we provided a double car garage um, as well as a, a two additional spots in that driveway. Um, and just to remind the commission on uh, some of the discussions we had on lots eight and 10, the driveway is required to um, only be 20 feet set back from your uh, front yard, uh, from your uh, front property line. We've added that additional foot at the request of the commission to make space for uh, a Ford F-150 or a large truck um, so that it doesn't overspill into uh, the street or the sidewalk. So that's staying consistent with that detail. We've done the same thing here. Um, we've also uh, provided two tandem spots um, for the EDU on the side of the home. Uh, again, it's not required by state law. Some of the first things we noticed um, when you know, speaking to local constituents and the commission was how dire the parking uh, need is within these neighborhoods. So we've um, uh, went ahead and added two additional parking spaces uh, for our one bedroom EDUs. Um, and you know, again, staying consistent with lots eight and 10, we've um, on the ADU parking created a, that Hollywood style driveway with that uh, strip of landscaping or uh, Mexicali pebbles or turf or grass crete um, that will differentiate between the lots um, to try to bring up that percentage of landscaping, which we'll get to in a moment. Additionally, in our main driveway, uh, you'll notice on our plans, we've also stayed consistent with the request that we make some of those driveways stained colored concrete or uh, use some pavers. So you can see on the plans that each uh, lot has a differentiation. Uh, there's four different differentiations of, uh, of finishes for the uh, Hollywood driveway as well as the main home uh, driveway. And again, um, as I mentioned, the EV charging stations are gonna be actually installed, um, one for the main home, one for the ADU, and then additionally at the guest parking spaces. Uh, the guest parking spaces are located, um, there's some at the clubhouse, there's some at the pocket park, and then there's additional guest parking spaces located at the north and southern parts of the, of the site as well. Uh, in terms of access, I'll just touch upon um, that really quick. The, the main entry is off of Western Avenue. Uh, there's only one main entry, um, and uh, there's an exit at that same location. Um, staying consistent with all of our other neighborhoods, this is an access-controlled community, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, there's also two pedestrian access points at that main entry. Um, there's a third access point uh, located directly south of the clubhouse, giving access to the corner of Western and La Brea. Maybe, maybe the, a resident wanted to uh, gain access to La Brea Avenue and go towards uh, the, the, the sports complex. Um, additionally, there's an exit uh, right turn only out um, to La Brea Avenue located at the southern portion of the project with two additional pedestrian access points. So five total pedestrian access points uh, for this project. Um, so just touching upon community safety, um, to the left side you'll see a rendering of what our uh, front entry gate, again consistent with the craftsman style architecture, um, which we'll get to in a moment. Uh, that's, again, it's a private gated community. As I mentioned, being consistent with all of our other neighborhoods, this uh, entry gate is uh, gonna be located 45 feet in lieu of the 25 foot requirement from the back of walk. 
um, to allow for potential pile up if uh, someone can't access the gate. We've also um, added the addition of that turnaround at the center, the center median in front of the gate for a, a vehicle that maybe made a mistake or couldn't get access uh, to the front gate for whatever reason to be able to turn around and exit. Um, you know, rather than providing, uh, rather than causing um, additional traffic. Um, there's security cameras located throughout this neighborhood. Um, there'll be a, a safe speed limit that's enforced by the management. Um, there's a network of walkways, which we'll, sh which we'll see in a moment, and uh, well-articulated well -articulated, uh, crosswalks with differentiation of materials and colors, um, as well as abundant site lighting. And again, it's a professionally managed community that will ensure the safety uh, of the residents. So um, for this slide, you see the walkability. We, for this specific um, site, we were able to manage. We, we managed to be able to fit walkways in front of all the frontages along the entire um, uh, neighborhood. Um, there's uh, well-articulated sidewalks as you're crossing some of these streets, and we spoke about the pedestrian connectivity with the five pedestrian access points that connect to the main public streets, retail, park, and school, as well as um, public transport. Uh, landscape design, staying consistent with uh, the requirements. We're providing one street tree uh, for every single lot. The landscape is stylistically coordinated with the architecture. So the architecture for this specific lot is um, the uh, craftsman style architecture. So when selecting uh, the trees and the overall landscaping, we're stylistically coordinating that with uh, traditional craftsman ar architecture and working with the, the city uh, urban forestry to achieve uh, drought tolerant landscaping that is native to Santa Maria. Uh, we spoke about the pocket parks and the gathering areas that have abundant of landscaping throughout, um, and we'll, we'll be using a sustainable drip irrigation system to minimize our water usage. So this is a, a rendering of the craftsman style architecture. So this is um, this. Uh, community only has 58 lots and uh, there was no specific corner lots. So we have four different style main uh, model homes with four different uh, color schemes as well as four different accent color schemes. So what that, uh, what that provides is uh, an, an immense amount of differentiation between each home. Um, in our calculations, only every, uh, every home will only be repeated exactly the same twice throughout the entire neighborhood. Um, the, just to point out that the specific plan only requires, um, requires you to repeat, you, that you can repeat every home, every fourth home can be repeated. We're only gonna have every 25th home be repeated. So we're going well above and beyond by you know, trying to create that differentiation between the homes. Um, and you'll see uh, that some of our homes have all these different types of accents, whether it's planter boxes under the windows, shutters, um, there's horizontal siding, there's vertical lap siding, there's stone at the base, there's different uh, color garage doors, uh, different color windows, different types of pitched roofs, um, as well as two different types of roofing materials um, that you'll see throughout our project. This is just uh, another slide which was brought up by Carol, and again, it's in your package of uh, the four different uh, home styles as well as the four different uh, color and material uh, packages. And this is just some inspirational photos of real, you know, um, homes that we kind of looked to when we were creating uh, some of these uh, architectural themes of modern uh, craftsman style architecture. And this is a typical lot layout. Um, you'll see the main home is uh, separated from the ADU um, with some privacy walls. Um, and it, I'm not sure if you can tell, but there's uh, some privacy fencing that actually separates um, the whole side of the ADU uh, from the parking space all the way to that front door, as well as uh, the yards in the back. We've also coordinated that no windows should be located along the uh, left side of the home looking into that ADU parking space for ample privacy, um, and the same thing for the ADU looking into that backyard. There's no windows along um, that southern portion of the ADU uh, looking into the main yard. So that, that provides that ample privacy. You know, you might have some residents that, you know, might have a family member living in that ADU, or it might be two separate strangers, so we wanted to create that differentiation. Um, there'll also be some landscaping that differentiates between the home and the ADU. Um, there's uh, a front porch located on most of the homes. Uh, some of the corner lots don't have a front porch for that visibility uh, code section. Um, there's a double height entryway right when you walk into the home, uh, creating that really nice uh, resident experience. There's thoughtful layouts, um, spacious kitchens, guest bathroom located on that ground floor, like a half bathroom. Um, and then as you go upstairs, there's uh, a, some units have three bedrooms, some units have four bedrooms, as shown in the package. Um, there's a large yard for the main home, 
Um, and then there's an additional patio for that ADU, again, with that privacy separating um, the home and the ADU. Uh, again, again, with drought tolerant landscaping that we covered earlier, um, uh, with the, the parking requirements that we covered earlier. Um, what you see on the screen in the white in that driveway is an actual model uh, Ford F-150 taken from Ford's website showing how that fits within our uh, driveway. Again, we extended those driveways to be one feet uh, beyond the code requirement. Uh, there's also solar on the home and the ADU, um, again, as, as well as that EV charger, trying to um, maximize uh, efficiency and look towards the future towards, you know, as we go towards electric vehicles. We also spoke about that Hollywood uh, strip of landscaping, which we'll get to in the modification shortly. So the first modification is a reduction in the in the 50% front yard landscaping requirement. This is exactly consistent with what was approved on lots eight and 10, um, where uh, we have a 54% uh, percent of our front yard is uh, in with a concrete with concrete, and 46% of that is landscaping. Um, the findings for this was that we you know we understood the need for that uh, additional parking for the ADU and trying to kind of meet halfway. We um, provided the parking, but have that. 4% reduction in um, in the landscaping requirement for those front yards. Again, staying consistent with what we um, shown on uh, on lots eight and ten, and that was approved on lots eight and ten. Our second modification is for that one corner lot. It's highlighted in yellow at the uh, top part of the screen. Um, again, that's on a dead end street, so um, the we you know the city's requirement for these uh, line of sight, it doesn't take into account um, approach, speed, stop signs, um, and speed limits as, as well within a neighborhood. This is a private gated community, so um, working with Public Works, we were able to uh, pull the, the Caltrans uh, code requirement, which we do meet. Um, it's a standard RD-38A, um, and in the provided analysis, you can see that we meet those code requirements, um, and, and again, uh, taking into consideration the approach, the speed, as well as, uh, as well as stop signs. Um, and uh, the third modification, again, staying consistent with, um, with uh, lots eight and 10, is that front yard encroachment of the living space. Um, and this was to be able to be, cons uh, to be able to comply with the uh, specific plan requirement that requires that your front yard, or front living space should be uh, set forward uh, six feet from your uh, garage. Um, and I'll also point out that uh, the um, specific plan maintains that you that the main feature of the home should be the home itself and not the garage. And this is one of the ways that you achieve that. Um, again, staying consistent with what we showed on lots eight and 10. Um, so overall, since this an, an original design of this project, there has been a number of changes just to refresh everyone's memory. So the ADU parking not required. Um, we're providing those two tandem parking spaces. There uh, initially was a covered ADU carport um, on those uh, on the side yard that encroached the side yard, um, and that was requested that they be removed. We removed those uh, carports. Um, the driveway length went from a 16-foot driveway to a 21-foot driveway to accommodate that Ford F-150 that we showed on the on the screen. Um, there were initially 20 guest spaces. We were able to um, move some of the homes around uh, to be able to achieve 30 guest parking spaces throughout the project. Um, initially, the home design was more of that white base with some color accents, and uh, to maintain, to be able to achieve a, a larger differentiation between the homes, we provided five base colors with multiple accents and trims and materials, and this is consistent throughout all of uh, Blossom Ranch. Um, walkability, so this is actually a mistake, but in, uh, we were able to achieve 100% of frontage with walkways, not the 80% um, uh, that, that you see on the screen. Um, the children's study room was added at the, at the direction of the planning commission, um, and then sidewalks, that's, that's a big one. So um, at the request of the commissioners, we made all of our sidewalks, again, staying consistent with lots eight and 10, going from the four foot sidewalks, which are per code, and we extended that to the five foot sidewalk. Um, and then we initially presented this project, there was a 41% uh, landscaped front yard to accommodate the ADU parking. Um, by adding that Hollywood driveway and additional uh, other modifications, we were able to achieve all the way up to that 46%, 4% lower than the city's requirement, um, while still maintaining the ADU parking. Um, so that uh, concludes my presentation for lot four. If um, we can either stop for questions on lot four, or we can go straight into lots nine and 11. I'll leave it up to the commission. Quick question. Question? Yeah, just a question. Is, 
are, are the next two that you're going to show, or are you going to have the same basic amenities, same basic thing? Or I mean, is, are, are they each going to have the same length? <laughs> I'm sorry, did you ask the question a little bit? A presentation. Bit oh, yeah, the presentation is... Or are the, they truncated? Well, I'll skip the all the slides that are repetitive, so okay. it'll be, it will be shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Continue. Um, so there are some differentiations between the amenities, and we just want to highlight them. Um, but moving to lots 9 and 11. Yeah, so really the only difference between 9 and 11 on lot 4 is um, in three areas. So the number one is going to be the architecture as a modern farmhouse, which we'll show, which I'll briefly go through. Um, the uh, a, Another change is some of the amenities are different. And then the third is that there's an additional modification that is being requested for this lot. So I'll just run through those uh, changes. So this is uh, our amenity uh, building in that rendering you see on the screen. Again, consistent. It's a larger amenity because this is a larger lot with a lot more homes. So it is physically larger, but achieving all those same different um, features that we've had consistently throughout um, all of Blosser Ranch um, with that children's study room added at the behest of the commission. Um, something a little different for lots 9 and 11 is that, um, you know, beyond the obviously a larger pool and spa and outdoor lounge spaces with fire pits and barbecues, um, water features, parks and shaded structured areas, um, we've also added an outdoor uh, pizza oven, which is something that's different. It's new. Apparently it's super in. So we're, you know, trying to make things a little different, uh, add some different experiences for the residents. Um, so that's an addition that we're uh, showing on, on lots 9 and 11. Um, there's also uh, an, another outdoor space. So in general, Lots 911 has larger outdoor areas, and there's, they're more numerous, um, which include uh, that outdoor library. It includes um, out, uh, multiple gathering spaces, um, as well as a fruit stand consistent with the uh, uh, farmhouse uh, style architecture. You know where children can host. Um, they can sell lemonade. They can sell cookies. They just creating that really uh, positive resident environment that is consistent with the farmhouse style architecture. Um, another outdoor space um, with uh, some changes and some, you know, they're slightly different. Um, you'll have some uh, hammocks on this one. Um, addition, again, additional outdoor spaces uh, with uh, additional water features. Um, staying consistent with the pet parks. We have the, you know, smaller pet run for the smaller pets and larger one for the larger pet. And again, the, the, the pictures you see on the screen are consistent with uh, farmhouse style architecture. So that's it for my amenities. Um, everything else in terms of parking, um, safety, and uh, is, is pretty much all the same. And I'll just go back to, this is just a rendering I wanted to show of the front entry gate, which is different and more consistent with uh, the farmhouse style architecture. So you see it includes that stone base, as well as a vertical board and batten siding with a standing sea metal roof. Wrong direction. Um, so what you see on the screen is a real-life rendering of that modern farmhouse-style architecture, five different uh, model homes for this specific neighborhood with five different uh, color schemes, with five different accent schemes. So again, uh, really only every 30th home would be repeated um, for this uh, neighborhood out of uh, 175 homes. So um, again, the specific plan require, uh, allows you to repeat every fourth home. We're repeating every fourth home, every uh, 30th home. Um, this was provided in the package, just uh, a little more detail of the materials and colors and accents uh, between the windows and the and the the, the uh, colors of the standing sea metal roof, um, the the uh, window the window uh, accent features such as the the shades and the and the the garage doors as well as the front entry porch and the front doors. Um, on the next two slides, you'll see some of those inspiration photos we took when designing this uh, project. Um, again, it just gives you an idea of actually completed projects. Um, you'll see uh, some differentiation of the front door, the garage door, lighting, uh, perimeter fencing, and uh, street lighting as well. Um, so the only differentiation between this and lots eight and 10, um, that fourth modification, which is that line of sight um, requirement, again, that we, we comply with the Caltrans um, standard RD-38A um, uh, that looks at a more dynamic uh, line of sight 
distance that is based off of approach of uh, uh, you know, speed and stop signs, et cetera. So again, working with public works, we comply with that, but we don't comply with the city standard, which is more of a one-off standard that doesn't look at that dynamic uh, movement of the vehicles. Um, again, this is a, a private gated community. So while you, uh, this, this standard is the same for a private community as, as a public road, on a public road, you might have a lot more cars driving through that neighborhood, of uh, people passing through to um, you know, avoid traffic, et cetera. Um, because this is a private gated community, only residents um, and their guests would be driving through, really limiting the traffic, um, as well as uh, uh, having that speed limit, which is a 15 mile speed limit, which is gonna be maintained and um, enforced by the management. Um, so that's it for, and everything else is the same. So in order to shorten the presentation, um, I'm open for any questions. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Questions? Yeah, perhaps a question. Bob. Thank you, Chair. A question for the um, front yard setback reductions. Is that for is that for most or, or almost all of the lots? It would be for uh, Commissioner Blanco. It would be for all of the all lots. Of yes. Okay. Um, so I'll just chime in on lot four. It's for all the lots on. Um, on lots nine and 11, there are certain front yards that are um, at least off of the side street that's a garage driveway. So in those areas, we do comply. And again, it's to be consistent with the specific plan requirement of having your livable space uh, set forward from the garage. Right, okay. Um, so I'm just looking at my list. I think you answered some of the questions as you went through the presentation. Um, yeah, I think that's it for now, thank you. Commissioners, uh, Mahajar, questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just as to the guest parking spaces, um, we have 30 for lot four, and then we have 69 for lots nine and 11. Um, okay, I think I must have read that wrong, but I guess since I have you, if you can confirm whether or not um, that's inclusive of the parking spaces immediately next to the community center. Um, yeah, that's inclusive of the parking spaces immediately by the community centers. So it's sprinkled throughout um, because it's such a large lot. You know, someone might want to drive to the community center instead of walking, so we provided the additional parking space. Okay, and then um, the, the guest parking spaces are going to be monitored by some type of parking enforcement, or yeah. So there's actually a condition um, that's included in in for both of these lots that um, residents cannot park there overnight. It's set aside specifically for guests to park overnight, um, but residents can use it during the the day the the daylight hours. Okay, they don't have an option to contact the leasing office if they want to park overnight to get some type of approval for that? Um, they would need specific approval for that in a specific circumstance, but um, you know, we're providing enough space on the lot for four cars of the main home, two cars in the, the ADU. Um, you know, a lot of people don't use their garage for parking, they'll use it for storage, but because this is a professionally managed community that will enforce those rules, you know, if someone's asking for an additional car, they're first gonna make sure that they have that, you know, that their garage is being used properly and that the driveways are being used properly. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's your ceiling heights on these units? So um, right when you walk into the unit, there's double height ceilings. So you have 24 foot height ceilings with uh, a stairwell going up. Um, but generally throughout the first floor, there's um, there are the average about 11 feet and then going up to the second floor. Um, in some areas where there's uh, drop ceilings, it can, uh, it, it can average around nine feet, but the most of the top floor is 10 feet. That's what I thought, thank you. So if you're gonna have a fruit stand out there and the kids are gonna sell stuff, is that gonna create a need for a permit? Just a question. I, I mean, these days, I think kids have to get permits to sell fruit. I'm not sure. Well, I think they do. Um, other than that, we've we've gone through this, uh, all of these uh, uh, projects with you, uh, and we've asked questions, many questions, uh, previous to this. And thank you for your presentation today. I think you've answered a lot of those for us. Um, brought those to light, uh, the things that we've changed uh, throughout this process, and why we've changed them. Um, and at this point, I think we've got to bring it back to the, if there's no more questions, we're going to bring it to the public and open it up to the Thank uh, you. public. Thank you very much. And I do have some speaker slips. Uh, we'll go for the public first. And we're gonna get another speaker slip. Uh, we'll start with Ken Delabout. 
uh, Dr. Ted Wendell to follow. Members of Commission, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. My name is Ted Wendell, Senior Vice President for AT Still University. I'm here to express my enthusiastic support for the uh, proposal here tonight. Uh, you may recognize I've been here before to talk about the challenges we face uh, in finding appropriate housing for our students, faculty, and staff. Uh, each year, right now, we bring 90 students into this community, and uh, those students are graduate students. Some of them have families, and they're looking for rental housing space, as described in this proposal. Uh, and then other students are looking for small rental units, just like the ADUs, with appropriate parking. So the the project you're thinking about here, you're discussing is ideal for what we're looking for in our need to provide uh, housing for our students. I want to talk about the future a little bit. Uh, right now it's 90 students, we've got about 20 uh, faculty and staff, but we're going to grow. And a project like this offers us the opportunity to recruit faculty and staff in the future because when they come to our, our community, it's really uh, an opportunity for them to rent a place and get to know the community before they buy a home. They might even buy a home in this community. The amenities are outstanding. Our students don't have a lot of time for amenities, but having them right there close is really important to them. So uh, in conclusion, I just wanna really tell you that this is an important uh, development and is very attractive to the development of our university here in this community. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, Mr. Ken Dalebout, please uh, state your name and uh, address for the record. Thank you. It's Ken Dalebout, Vice President of uh, Strategy and Operations for Marion Regional Medical Center. And I uh, represent Dignity Health this evening <coughs> or Marion Regional Medical Center. Um, Marion Regional Medical Center is the, the sole provider of acute care services for the Santa Maria Valley. And beyond just what we do in our facilities, uh, the hospital has a vested interest in the development of a healthier community. And one of the key determinants uh, of a healthier community is adequate and quality housing. Uh, there is abundant research and all of us have lived experience for those communities where there is not adequate housing, um, the health status of that community declines. And so from a very global perspective, Dignity Health, Marion Regional Medical Center supports uh, any project that brings adequate housing to a community. Uh, much as our, uh, our, our university that's uh, bringing on uh, our, our healthcare providers has just stated, this project has the type of housing that affects or is uh, effective for recruiting uh, all, all levels of healthcare professionals. One of our uh, experiences consistently is offering uh, employment to all levels of uh, healthcare providers and having those offers declined because of the cost of living, because of the inadequacy of housing to bring somebody here. Uh, for those that do work for us here, many of them choose to commute from far distances uh, in order to have the housing that they want. Um, and that long commute just isn't sustainable uh, to guarantee a workforce. From a demographic standpoint, Santa Maria Valley is going to continue to grow, and the growth uh, projections are, uh, are significant. One of our concerns is we don't have adequate housing now as this population grows if we don't provide housing 
um, for our healthcare workers. We won't have sufficient healthcare workers to take care of this community. And so it, it perpetuates this concern of inadequate housing will create uh, a community with lesser uh, outcomes, uh, healthcare outcomes. And not to be self-promoting, but a strong hospital really is, sits at the heart of a strong community. And so we would love to continue to have a strong hospital and a strong hospital. So we uh, urge your support of housing and this, uh, and this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go with uh, Lindy Hatcher and then uh, Glenn, you can do the pickup. Good evening, Chair Seifert and Planning Commission. I'm Lindy Hatcher, Executive Director of the Home Builders Association of the Central Coast, and our physical address is 3765 South Higuera Street in San Luis Obispo. Um, the HBA represents our members, which include home builders, subcontractors, trades, consultants, realtors, bankers, insurers, pretty much anyone working on housing in San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. And we support projects like Blosser Ranch. Uh, we think that it provides housing of all types and specifically workforce housing. There's a direct correlation between jobs and housing and a lack of housing is the number one reason employers have a hard time um, recruiting and retaining good employees. We cannot work on new jobs and economic development until we have adequate housing supply. Increasing housing supply decreases the competition for an inadequate quantity of housing and the end result is lower housing prices, which we all want, and lower rents. The Blosser Ranch project offers coveted amenities that will definitely enrich the quality of life for its residents. Uh, this is a rare infill opportunity, lowering VMTs. It also helps the city obtain community necessities like fire stations, schools, um, infrastructure improvements, and parks that the city would otherwise have to provide. So we ask you to move this project forward after your thorough but timely review and we believe this project as submitted supports Santa Maria's vision for responsible growth and expansion, achieves the state's goals for reduced VMTs and building infill wherever applicable, and it adds workforce and other housing stock to reduce skyrocketing purchase and rental prices. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Glenn. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Um, you know, I want to echo um, Mr. DeLabout's comment. Oh, who are who you? Who am I? Yeah, Glenn Morris, uh, Santa Maria Valley Chamber of Commerce. I don't know, it's late. Um, I want to I build off of um, Mr. DeLabout's comments about the need to, to, to build a healthy community um, and, and echo that, but I think we need to think, we need to go beyond that, right? I think it's time that Santa Maria starts to make decisions and choices that make Santa Maria um, the community of choice uh, on the Central Coast. And I think that starts with having a full range of housing options so that whatever housing situation you want to live in, you can find it in our community. But it goes beyond just providing the housing. I think it also is building whole communities and whole neighborhoods. So things like the amenity package um, with a regional park with a school being planned, potentially more than one school on that site, uh, being planned within that community where, where families can walk. Um, building in uh, the commercial into that neighborhood where you know there's very little for a very large um, residential section of our community over there. Relocating the fire station, right? And, and putting it in a place where it can actually serve the community at a much more efficient um, you know, manner. Th th these are amenities that come um, when we decide to do things the, the right way. And, and I think it's worth pausing as we get to the end of reviewing all of the components of this master plan um, and, and reflect on 
you know, how we got here over the last couple of years, right? Um, every community in the state is arguing and talking and fighting about how they're gonna build housing. Um, Santa Maria rolls up its sleeves, finds um, builders and developers that are willing to work with us, and we go to work. Um, we didn't agree on everything at the beginning, but we collaborated, right? The developer gave some, made some concessions, the commission met them part way, and, and staff facilitated those conversations. I think there's a lot to learn about this process that other communities would do, would take, you know, would do well to take note of. Um, you know, I, I, th I think as we, as we think about students at, at our universities and, and our colleges, we think about our friends who um, join our community for two to five years um, and work in, in, you know, at Vandenberg. Um, you know, we think about our healthcare workers, we think about teachers, we think about the city employees, we think about, you know, all of these folks that, that are looking for a way to have a nicer community, right? A community they can be proud to live in. Um, I think this project goes an awful long way towards that. And I really want to just take a moment and, and applaud um, the developer, the, your staff, and, and the commission and the council um, for, for, for pushing through a very large, complicated project um, and coming out at the back end with what I think we can hold up with an awful lot of pride uh, to any of our neighbors around the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Zoom? No one's on Zoom. Uh, I don't believe we have any rebuttals. I'm going to close the public hearing and then I'm going to bring it back to the commission. Discussion or motions and resolutions? Commissioners? Commissioner Blanco. Yeah, um, I, I definitely want to say that I appreciate the, um, you know, the comments that uh, we had made on prior um, projects, slot eight and ten, that uh, the applicant and, and staff have kind of brought those uh, comments and revisions forward to these developments. I certainly appreciate that. Um, you know, and that that goes a long way towards, um, you know, uh, I think incorporating the, those things and and hopefully streamlining the processes. Um, I I do like the architecture too honestly i do like the variety of architecture that some of these um that these developments have um shown um the amenities you know the more i look at them those amenities are are definitely things that i think those residents are going to enjoy um the thoughtfulness on the parking situation i appreciate the um you know the, the additional parking that's been uh, incorporated it's always a problem. I think we've talked about it up here at almost every project is, is parking is such a huge issue. Uh, and it continues to be, but you know, wherever we've got new developments where we can address that situation, um, it goes a long way, I think, towards the residents being happy with their development and, and just the amount of, I think, sometimes vehicle clutter that we tend to see. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, and you know, the, the housing, obviously, you know, I think we're, you know, everybody struggles with finding housing, it seems like, in other communities. But hopefully uh, these kind of projects, if done right, hopefully we'll address that and, and maybe address the concerns of some of our um, uh, business partners and, and developments or, or businesses in the, in the area. So uh, those are just my comments. I just wanted to uh, express my, my thankfulness for incorporating some of those things or, or really all the things from lots eight and ten and um yeah I, I, I i'm very happy with uh with the way things have gone on these other projects so that's it thank you commissioner Mahajer. thank you yeah i definitely have to agree with commissioner blanco i think that the developers were really consistent throughout um this entire development and really were thoughtfully um put their efforts in ensuring the top tier in amenities and enriching those residents lives um, i do think it's going to be a great contribution to the city overall um, understanding you know the upcoming school and sports center that's going to you know ultimately occur i think that parking you know is always a priority and we're always going to talk about it so thank you for putting that at the forefront um, so i have to agree i'm definitely in support of this i think it's going to provide a great 
variety of housing for our community. Commissioner Dickerson, nothing? Uh, I, I would like to thank you guys. Uh, we've worked with you for quite a while now, and uh, you, you've, you've listened to all our concerns. We've uh, worked some things out. We've given and taken. Uh, I think we've worked out a, a really nice area to live, and uh, I'm excited to see it built. Um, the only thing that we lost was the covered ADU parking, uh, and I forget the reason why we lost that, but there was a good reason. I, I did like that covered parking, though. Uh, I, I would have rather incorporated that, but uh, we couldn't. So I do thank you for all the hard work on that. Uh, I do believe this is going to be a nice project, and I do like the amenities. Um, and at this time, can I hear a... Uh, we're going two resolutions and two motions. Are they one by one, like individual? I would read them one by one. All right, we'll start with uh, number one here by resolution, approved tentative track map TR 2023-0001 for lots nine and 11. Do I hear a second? A second. And can I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Commissioner Mohajer? Aye. Commissioner Dickerson? Aye. Chair Seifert? Aye. Continue, I'd like to, uh, by resolution, uh, approve tentative trap map TR 2023-00-0002 for lot four. Do we have a second? Second. And a roll call, please. Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Commissioner Mohajer? Aye. Commissioner Dickerson? Aye. Chair Seifert? Aye. Uh, thirdly, by motion, approve plan development permit PD 2023-0002 for lots 9 and 11 as revised in the staff presentation. And by motion, approve plan development permit PD 2023-0007 as revised in the staff presentation for lot 4. And do we hear a second? Second. And can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Blanco? Aye. Commissioner Mahajer? Aye. Commissioner Dickerson? Aye. Chair Seifert? Aye. Resolutions and motions pass. Thank you very much for your patience tonight. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, the. It's okay. Uh, at this time, we're going to go with the other business, oral reports from Planning Commission and staff. Staff, do we have any thing to report on? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair Seifert and Commissioners. Uh, I'll just go over the upcoming schedule. So we're meeting for a study session tomorrow at 1.30 in uh, Shepherd Hall to discuss the Cook Street apartment project. It's another one of the downtown um, apartment projects that we've been working on and then we have a hearing scheduled November 15th um, at, and we are going to be bringing the housing element um, to your commission on that date we did receive our letter from the state that our current housing element substantially conforms to all the required state law so we're ready now to move forward to, to hearings so we're looking at November 15th for your commission and then um, I believe December 5th for City Council. I'm looking at Frank for City Council. Um, and then we have study session November 16th. We have another hearing December 6th. And I've realized now we have an open study session December 7th. So good news, I can bring back the ADU ordinance on December 7th to study session and we can have a good conversation and 
get everyone's questions answered and all that figured out. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, and um, so after December 7th, we don't have any other um, items scheduled for hearings the rest of the year. So uh, the December 20th hearing and 21st study session, I, I was going to cancel um, just also due to the holidays. Good plan. Okay, so that's the update that I have, um, but I'm available for, for questions as well, if anyone has any. And do we have any reports from uh, commissioners? We're adjourned. I did, and I used it.